Hi everyone, it's uh, Peter here. I'm going to try and storm through this mock paper that you've done um, as quick as possible. And that means that I might be glossing over a few things, but if I do, I'll bring the mark scheme down. So if you wanted to, you could pause the video at certain bits. But this is going to explain basically how you can try and get all the marks for the mock. Um, apologies for the sound, it's directly recorded on my phone, so it's probably a bit echoey. So, two models of the atom, plum pudding model and the nuclear model. We should know that these are electrons. And this is your atom in the plum pudding model, but in the nuclear model we have a nucleus, and these are going to be the orbits of the electrons. And in the nuclear model that was created after the plum pudding model, they, discard, they, they came up with the idea of orbits, but, but the next model along, um, the Bohr model of the atom, atom, put the electrons into shells, not orbits. So they stopped becoming like planets and they started to kind of fit into these discrete shells instead. So orbits didn't last very long inside the planetary, inside the nuclear model. It ended up changing to something else. And um, why does a positive charge on every element of an atom, uh, why is the positive charge on every element of an atom the same? The reason behind the positive charge being the same um, is because every single element um, has the same number of protons. That's basically what the, the, the idea of an element has. Um, most people said that, but then they forget to, they forgot to add like the most basic stuff. Whenever you get a GCSE question, you have to not you have to remember that the examiner is not going to assume you know anything. So if you start with the same number of protons, you need to also say that protons are um, the only positively charged thing inside an atom. So all protons have a positive charge, and every atom of an element has the same number of protons, so every single um, atom of an element has the same positive charge, because it comes from the protons. Um, so question 1.3. Um, alpha particles are going at 7% the speed of light, and you know the speed of light is that, so you do 7% times 300 million. Um, so on calculator, my nice pink calculator, 7% um, is the same as 0 0.07 if you do it as a decimal, times 300, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, equals 2, 1, Zero, 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 zero. Group your zeros together. Someone lost a mark because they added an extra zero. So make sure that you're copying it from the calculator correctly. My calculator, I don't know if you can see, actually has like a thousands divider, which I like. Here, hydrogen atom has a radius of 2.5 times 10 to the minus 11. Determine the radius of a, um, a magnesium atom. And... left my ruler alone but what you're meant to do is recognize that if these are um, to scale and it's, you can assume they are because there's user measurements in figure two you look at this diameter of this one and the diameter and the radius are linked obviously if you double the radius you've got the diameter so you, you measure that and you also measure that and you compare them so this one I'm having to measure this very strangely because I've got a weird ruler. That's about 12 millimeter diameter. And this one is coming up to about 73 millimeter diameter. So the magnesium one has a diameter um, of 73 mil on this diagram, and the hydrogen one is 12 mil. So I can work out how much bigger that is by doing 73 divided by 12. So the magnesium one is 6.08 times bigger in diameter, and which means it's going to be 0, 6.08 times bigger in radius. So if I do that value, multiply it by 2.5 times 10 to the minus 11, we get 2.5 times 10 to the minus 11 times the 6.08, which is my ratio, and I get 1.52 times 10 to the minus 10 meters. The mark scheme says that you can have any ratio in the range of 5.8 to 6.3 because some people will be measuring the, the, the diameter slightly differently. So 
I've got 6.08. Anything between 5.7 and 6.3 is fine. So if you see that, you get a one mark, and then you multiply that by um, you multiply that by the 2.5. And they're, they're saying the answer should be around about 1.5, but anywhere between 1.4 to 1.6 times 10 to the minus 10 is fine. So I've got 1.52. That's perfect. So question two. Plan an experiment that will allow the student to determine the density of an object. But most people actually answer this really well. Um, and we've kind of gone through these questions loads in class. So I'm just going to show you the mark scheme and leave it there for a little bit. Um, but it's the basic idea that you need to measure the mass by using a, a scale, measure the volume by a displacement method. So that's when you fill up a can and see and, and water overflows. And then the amount of water that overflows is equal to the volume of the water that overflows, which is equal to the volume of the actual thing that you put inside the water. So that mass divided by volume equals your density. A lot of people did really well on that, so I'm going to leave that there and pause the video and you can have a look at the mark scheme. Yeah. Can you see it on the video? Yeah, you can. Cool. So, question 2.2. Um, complete figure 4. Write the correct scale on the y-axis. Okay, so it says here that you've got acrylic and nylon. Nylon is meant to be at 1,000, which is great, because I, I can just do a little line there and say 1,000. Um, I'm guessing that has to be zero. And then what you can see is the halfway mark is going to be 500, and that must mean that um, exactly the same distance up is going to be 1,500. Um, and then this one is going to be 250. Might as well put in some extra ones just in case. Um, and this is going to be 1250. And the polyester is one, sorry, so that's not polyester. And polyester is 1380. So 1380 is around about this line here. And I would just draw it probably the same thickness as the other ones, but it doesn't really matter too much. It's the height that matters in this case. That's my polyester. And polystyrene is 1040. And most people got this right when they were drawing the actual um, bars in. PVC, 11, so each of these little squares is actually worth 50. So the next one I'll up is this one here, PVC, and you've done the mark scheme, wants you to have a minimum of three values on the y-axis. So if we just left it at 500, 1000, 1500, we would have got that mark. The Next part of this question, um, 2.3, determining uncertainty. So this is where some people fell down and weren't 100% sure about what to do. So we've covered this very briefly in the beginning of year 10, and we've probably forgot about it since then. If you have a range of values, so this student has tried to measure the density of um, a piece of plastic, and every time... Um, the student did it, there was a different value for density. So they're all quite close, they're around about the 1000 mark. So we could work out the average um, if we wanted to, but the uncertainty is due, there is an uncertainty there because it's not exactly 1000, it's, it's definitely not just 960, it, it's anywhere between these values. So the range of values, and the range of values goes between um, the lowest, 960, all the way up to the highest. Um, 1, 1, 2, 0. And the uncertainty is just plus or minus um, half the range. So if the range is 1, 1, 2, 0 minus 960, that's the full range, 160. So there's 160 kilograms per meter uh, cubed um, inside this range. It goes, it goes all the way from a low value all the way all the way from there, zero to there, really really big range. Half of that is 80, so the uncertainty is plus or minus 80 kilograms meet, uh, per meter cube. So that, that basically means that the range is 160. So that means if you take the middle value of that range, you know that you're going to only have to go 80 in one direction, 80 in the other direction, and that is what we call the uncertainty. Um, that's sometimes called absolute uncertainty. 
Question three. Um, what describes the movement of air particles in a canister? So they move in random directions and they move with a range of different speeds. Um, we should know that. 3.2, the mean speed of the particles would increase. Um, and we say the mean speed of the particle uh, or the average speed of the particle because some of them will still be slow and some of them will be fast, but on overall the average speed will increase. Question 3.3. It could be dangerous if the temperature of the air inside the canister increased by a very, very large amount. Or well, most of you got the idea that it could explode, but it's, it's two marks. So um, pressure could increase, and then that could cause an explosion. Um, so the pressure bit is the first mark, the explosion bit is the second mark. Um, this question says, Estimate atmospheric pressure. Estimate the atmospheric pressure. So, <coughs> sorry. The um, pressure in the can canister was recorded every five minutes, um, and you can see that over time the pressure just decreases and decreases and decreases. It's decreasing to the same value as atmospheric pressure because it's going to kind of equalize with um, the atmospheric pressure, which is down here. So that's 0 0.1. Um, megapascals. 3.5. The divers can safely stay underwater until it's reduced to tw until the pressure is 25% of the original value. The maximum time the diver can stay underwater. So this is the original value of the pressure, which is um, 2. Point, it's around about 2.25. So 25% of that pressure. Well, it's 2.25 megapascals. 25% um, of that pressure multiplied by 25%, and we've got 0 0.56. I'm just going to say 0 0.56 megapascals. So that's where it's got to go to. So 0 0.56 is around about there. So if I draw a line across, and you should always draw lines across on the graph, it makes it clear to the examiner that they know what you're doing. I draw a line down. I'm getting um, about 26 minutes. Some people wrote down 23 because they weren't reading the scale properly. So 26 minutes is roughly what you should get. Um, in, in the mark scheme, it says anywhere between 26 and 28, depending on how you had actually plotted that point on the graph. So 3.6, what happens to the volume of air when it's released from the, from the canister? Well, it's under high pressure. So when it's under high pressure, that's when it's in the canister, and under um, normal atmospheric pressure, this is what happens, it spreads out a lot more, so the volume increases. The volume goes up, because it's, it now has more space to open up. Um, the pressure goes down, the volume increases. We should know the link between pressure and volume. Okay, question four. Okay. This is about nuclear radiation. I'm just going to open the mark scheme up. Um, just to double check that I'm not doing anything wrong. An alpha particle is two charged particles and two neutral particles, yes. So it's two protons and two neutrons. Um, it's not two charged particles and four neutral particles, it's two positives and then two neutral ones. If it was four, charged, four neutral particles, it would be four neutrons, that's not right. Beta radiation is a negative charge because it's an electron. Um, and which statement about gamma radiation is true? It has a very, very long range in air. Um, it doesn't do anything else. It's not a low frequency EM wave, it's a high frequency EM wave. The question um, carries on. It's a more half life stuff, I believe. So, question 4.4. Um, this one is about the risk linked with each isotope and how it has changed between 1986 and 2018. So, these are two isotopes that were released from Chernobyl. One has a half-life of 30 years, one has a half-life of 8 days. So, in 1986, if you want to, you can actually just use your calculator, uh, add on 30 years, and we're almost at 2019. So, um, in cesium-137, just 
over one half-life has passed. So the radioactivity of cesium-137 has gone down by about 50%. Iodine-131 has a half-life of eight days. So iodine-131 um, has a half-life that's very low. Very, very, very low. So it's incredibly low. Um, if we look at the 33 years that have passed, um, there are 12,045 days that have gone past, and that means that there have been 1,505 half-lives of iodine. So many half-lives have passed. Um, iodine's activity is reduced dramatically. Um, anyone wanting to know how you'd actually calculate what the percentage activity would be? Um, it's actually going to be 2 to the power of our last answer, um, which it doesn't let me do because it's got a decimal in it. So let's round that to 1506. 2 to the power of 1506. Maybe it's just too big. Sorry, 0.5, not 2 to the power of 1506. 0.5 to the power of 1506. It gives me about 0. 0.5 to the power of um, 1506. Yeah, it's such a small number, it's just coming up as 0. If I just make it um, half to the power of 1500, I get a really small number, 10 to the power of minus 47. It's reduced dramatically. It's almost... Nothing. Don't worry about what I was doing on the calculator. That's just beyond Jesus. 4.5. What was the year the activity of cesium-137 will be one thirty, um, one thirty, thirty second of its original value? So it starts off um, with 100%. And then in one half-life, it goes down to half. Another half-life, it goes down to a quarter. Another half-life, it goes to an eighth. Another half-life, it goes to a sixteenth. I'm just going to see if you can see this on here. Yeah. Another half-life, it goes to one thirty second. So how many half-lives was that? It was one, two, three, four, five, five half-lives. So five arrows. So it takes one half-life to go to 50%, to 25%, which is a quarter, to an eighth, to um, um, a sixteenth, and then to a thirty second. So it goes five half-lives. That's the first bit. Okay, that's really important. And we know that one half life takes 30 years because it tells us at the top of the table. 30 years times five, so it's going to take 150 years. So what year is it going to be at one thirty second? Well, that's going to be five half lives after the year it was released. I add 18, sorry, 1986. And I get the year two, one, three, six. So that's how many years after 1986. Um, you'd have to go before the half-life goes to one thirty-second of its original value. Question five. How does the wall reduce unwanted energy transfers? So this is a, a wordy question. The mark scheme is actually quite good on this, so I'm going to show you that. Mark scheme says the wall has two or three layers. Um, the cavity wall has insulation um, or low thermal conductivity. Low thermal conductivity or thermal means heat. Um, conductivity is how quickly the heat passes through, so it doesn't allow heat to pass through quickly. That's what this idea of low thermal conductivity means. Heat passing through, low heat passing through. That's kind of what it's going at. Um, so less energy is transferred by conduction. Less energy is actually being passed through or the rate of energy transfer is low. That's okay. Um, 
So that's how it reduces unwanted energy transfers. The next question, 5.2, second turn page. Okay, 5.2. Uh, what's the temperature in the house after 30 minutes? So it's somewhere between these two. The temperature in the house at 20 minutes is that. The temperature in the house at 40 minutes is that. Well, it's difficult to work it out because it might be, it, you can assume it's a linear relationship and then you just go for halfway between the two. So let's go for halfway between the two. Um, so all we need to do is we go 20.8 plus 17.8 four equals divided by two, and I get 19.1. So I'm basically working out the average of these two, and I'm saying that's roughly going to be, 30 seconds is roughly going to be the average of those two, which is 19.1. So that's how I kind of do it. Um, it. There are other ways to do it, but that's basically right. That's not perfect, because what really would happen is the temperature won't go down, kind of, if this is the temperature, and this is the time, the temperature won't, necessarily go down like that, it might go down more like a curve. Um, so this is the way that it would normally work, it would normally go down like a curve. But what we're doing, with working out an average, is we're saying if we know this value and this value, then we can roughly say what this value is going to be. Okay, question 5.3. How are different energy stores changed by the boiler? Another one that the mask scheme answered really well. The chemical energy store, which means the amount of physical kind of chemical energy there is inside it goes down. The chemical energy still goes down. The amount of thermal energy in the water goes up. So the chemical energy goes down and the thermal energy goes up. Um, the thermal energy also of the air increases as well. They allow you to talk about kinetic energy because thermal energy is on a microscopic scale the same as movement of particles. So when the thermal energy of the water goes up, that's the same as the, the speed of the water particles and the kinetic energy of the water particles going up. And the same with the air. Instead of just saying the heat, um, thermal energy store of the air increases, kinetic energy store of the air particles increases. Um, if you haven't used this word store before and you're not 100% sure how to use it, don't worry. Um, you won't get marked down. For, I don't think you're going to get marked down um, for using that word, for not using that word, you'll still get the mark. Question 5.4. What more people mess up on here is 15 megajoules is 15 million joules. So you always have to convert back to joules, and 10 minutes, you have to convert that into seconds. You can use a calculator, 10 times 60 is 600 seconds. Um, so the power equation, power is energy divided by time. That's 15 uh, million divided by 600. We do 15, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, divided by 600. We get 25,000 0, 0, 0, um, 25, watts or 25 kilowatts if you wanted to convert it into kilowatts. So that's how you answer question 5.4. The next question, question 6. This, is, this stumped a few people, unfortunately you just had to know this graph for a filament lamp. Um, what happens with a filament lamp is when it gets, um, uh, when more current goes through, um, it basically gets hotter. And that has an effect of making the resistance higher, which makes it more difficult for the, for the current to increase. So as you add current, as you increase the potential difference, the current goes up. So it starts off with the current going up um, as the potential difference goes up. But as you start to add more and more current, it makes it harder and harder for the current to go up. So instead of curving up like this, the current kind of starts to level off like that. You had to also do exactly the same thing on the negative side. So negative voltage would lead to negative current, um, but it's and end up like that. So it kind of flatlines um, a little bit. You don't have to get it perfectly flat and do never, never do this. Never go back on itself. You don't want to do that. That's not good. So don't do that. Because some people did that and it meant that it was difficult to give them a mark. Um, so that's what's going on. The, cu the currents, I1, I2 and I3. Well, this is nice and easy. I1 
a lot of people got this right. At this point here, I1 splits into I2 and I3. So I1 equals I2 plus I3 would give you one mark. Another mark for saying something like I2 should equal the same as I3. There we go. Or, or just to say that I1 equals two times I2. Something that I would do. It's just the idea that current splits in parallel. And as long as these filament lamps are identical, there's no, it should be 100% current here, and then 50% current here, and 50% current here, and then that, that, when it gets to this point here, it should join up again and be 100% current there. Question 6.3. Calculate the charge that flows through the cell in one minute, 60 seconds. I'm already converting it before I've even read the rest of the question, and you should do that too. Underline the numbers and convert them if you need to. Um, what is the charge that flows through the cell in one minute? Let me just check that I haven't moved the piece of paper too much. There you go. So, charge is Q. Um, and if you're never sure what to do in an equation, in a, in a question like this, write down what you start with. What, write down the equations you know. Q equals IT is an equation you should know, quit. Um, so, we can work out charge if we know current and time. But well, we know time, but we don't know current. So what other equation do we know? We know um, P equals IV, the power. This is power equals um, current times voltage. And what we have here is an equation where we've got power, we need current, but we haven't got current, and we need voltage, and we haven't got voltage, so we can't use this equation by itself. There's another power equation. Um, Actually, there's another equation, V equals IR. We should know those, V equals IR. Um, but again, we can't use this because we haven't got V or I or R. But these are, these are some of the most important equations for electricity. And there's another one that we should know as well, which is voltage is energy so divided by charge. So that one, we don't need to use for this, but we should know these equations. And we should also know how to substitute one equation into another one. So... What we need to recognise here is we have power, and we have R, and we have T. And we need to find a way of getting Q. Q equals IT. Um, so we need to figure out a way of working this out. We don't... Um, we have an equation here that has R in it, so we need to figure out a way of getting this equation into this equation here. Now. The only way to do that is by substituting V for IR. So in this equation, P equals IV. Instead of writing down V again, I'm going to substitute V for um, I times R. So now I have P equals I times I times R, which is P equals I squared R. So I keep on changing my I's to have these little ticks at the top, make them all over. So P equals I squared R means that if I rearrange it, P divided by R equals I squared. So straight away, I can actually work out I now, because P is 3 watts and R is 12. So I know, I can use my calculator if I wanted to, so that's a quarter. So I squared is a quarter. And if I root that, I should get I, I'll, I'll root it to show you, um, should be a half. The root of the root of one quarter is a half. So that's half an amp. That's a really really hard process to get to get to. And if you got to that, you did really well. The next bit is to work out how to go from here to charge. And we said right at the beginning, the the only equation that we really really need to use that has charge in it is this one, Q equals I times T. Well, now we know I, that's a half, and we know T, that's um, one minute, which is 60 seconds. So I know that the amount of charge that flows is going to be 30 coulombs. So it looks like I've got my answer, but I'm just going to pause for a moment because it says here that each filament lamp has a power of that and a resistance of that. Calculate the charge that flows through the cell, not the filament lamp. So if there is 30 coulombs that pass through this in one minute, and 30 coulombs that pass through this in one minute, that's the amount of charge that flows along this branch, and that's the amount of charge that flows along this branch. 
the amount of charge that flows up here is going to be double that because the current is, is, is joining up again. So the amount of charge that flows is actually going to be 60 coulombs through the cell, even though it's only 30 coulombs through each of the, um, each of the lamps. That's a tough question. You do, you do get a mark for saying coulombs, and I'm going to put the mark scheme here so you can have a look um, where the marks are. But you get um, you get one mark for saying coulombs. You'll get um, four marks if you get down to thirty. Um, one extra mark for seeing that you need to double it to get sixty. If you've got the current zero point five, that gives you three marks out of six. So getting to the point where you get a current equals half an amp gives you half the marks for that question because that's a tough question. To, that's, that's a tough one to do. So one of the hardest things in physics is to know which equation to use. And that's one of those questions that really does test which equation to use. I would say that that's kind of on the level of like the, the eights and nines, um, the grade eight and nine, that's a really tough question. So question 6.4, how, um, how do readings on meters change when the environmental conditions change? This is an LDR, it's a six mark question. It's a light um, dependent resistor. And we need to know a few things about LDRs and light dependent resistors, and that's why we did an experiment on them. We know that the more light, the lower the resistance. So more light leads to a lower value for resistance. And if there's low resistance, it's easier to get through. So if there's lower resistance here, if this resistance goes down, then the electrons are going to go along here and back to the top. They don't go through the voltmeter because the, the voltmeter's got such high resistance it's almost like having a break in the circuit. So the electrons are going to go along. Well, actually, I'm showing you the direction of current. The current goes along, all the way along this way, and all the way back again. And when there's lower resistance, Um, so when the resistance decreases in LDR, resistance of the circuit drops. And as the, the voltage here doesn't change, that means that if there's lower resistance, the current will then increase. So ammeter, the ammeter will give higher reading. So the ammeter will give a higher reading. So we've dealt with the ammeter, we've dealt with the current. What about the voltage? So with the voltage, um, so the resistance is lower, so it's easier to get through. It's easier to get through LDR, so less energy is needed to get through the LDR, so less voltage needed get through LDR. So the voltmeter gives um, a lower reading. You could also add that because there's less energy needed to get through the voltmeter, sorry, to get through the LDR, then that energy is used up getting through this resistor. So you could say that as well. The mark scheme is actually quite involved. So let's have a look. Resistance of LDR changes when light intensity changes. Let's actually mark my answer because I haven't looked at this mark scheme in a while. The resistance of the LDR changes um, when the light intensity changes and when light intensity increases, the resistance of the LDR decreases. More light, lower resistance. So I've got those first two marks. Resistance of the circuit decreases. Resistance of the circuit drops. Yes. The current in the ammeter increases. Higher reading for the ammeter. Current increases. Um, potential difference across the total resistance made in the change. I didn't say that here. Um, so let's have a look at the next bit. Potential difference across the fixed resistor increases. I didn't write that down. I said you could say that. Potential difference across the LDR decreases. Less voltage needed to get through the LDR. Yes. Um, so easier to get through the LDR. Less voltage. So um, reading on the voltmeter decreases. Voltmeter gives a lower reading. Yes. So I just about scraped those six marks because I was rushing it. But I did get six marks. Have a look at the mark scheme. Make sure that you pause the video here if you wanted to read about this a bit more. Okay.
six points. Oh, I'm going to stop there. We're going to look at the second part of this in the next video. Okay. Hello everyone and good morning. This is um, the second part of the mock paper. This is um, part two, starting with question number one. And this is about forces. So in this paper, um, like the last one, I'm gonna try and, try and go through the questions quite quickly. If I feel like I'm going through too quickly, I'll just pull the mark scheme down so you can have a quick look and you can pause the video when you want. So question one. Um, which two statements describe the effect that um, this would have on the glider? Um, so the glider is released from rest and moved along the track, the mass holder hits the ground before the card passes through the second light gate. So when, there's, um, when this is actually kind of falling, it's, it's being pulled down by gravity, so it's exerting a weight, um, which is equal to its mass times gravity. And if it's exerting a force, it's going to be causing an acceleration because of Newton's second law. F equals ma. If there's a force, there's an acceleration, which means that if there's a force, something will speed up. So as this is being pulled down, it will speed up. Um, but what happens? What happens when it stops? Is there is no force, so it kind of it kind of starts to slow down. Um, so. With this particular question, the acceleration will end up decreasing to zero because there is no more force. So there's no more force, the acceleration becomes zero, um, so it just kind of starts to slow down. Um, and the resultant force on it is also decreasing to zero because whatever happens to the force happens to the acceleration, um, and because usually you keep the mass the same. 1.2 mass holder should not hit the ground before the card passes through the second light gate. How could you stop this from happening? Okay, you can have a taller table. Um, you could decrease um, distance between the gates. So you've got a light gate here and you've got a light gate here. You could just move them really close to one another so that they're really, really, really close together. Um, or you, you could shorten the string. That could work too. So those are the different things you can do. Um, 1.3. The two mistakes made in the acceleration column. Okay, well one of them you should be able to point out. That is an anomalous result. 6.4, the 6.4 um, is, you know, the 6.4, 7.2, 6.4, um, there's an anomaly, um, and it should have been it should have been removed, or you should have redone it again so that the average ends up being six point four. So you shouldn't include an anomalous result when you're working out an average. Um, another mistake is this: the number of decimal places should all be the same. So if you're measuring any data to one decimal place. When you work out an average, you can't then say, okay, well, I know that my average is gonna be to 20 decimal places because you're implying that you know something more than was originally in your data. So your original raw data had one decimal place. So the way that you should do things logically is make this all one decimal place. And they have done it here and here and here and here, but they haven't done it in this one. So you should have the same number of decimal places. So the wording in the last scheme is give all values to two significant figures. It says allow give to one decimal place. Um, discard the anomalous result and recalculate the mean. That's discard the anomalous result and recalculate the mean. So 1.4, write a conclusion for this investigation. Well, it goes back to um, to Newton's law, which is F equals ma, what you're doing here is you're changing the force and you're changing the acceleration. You can see as the force goes up, the acceleration goes up. So force is proportional to acceleration. And that gives you the mark. It says if force is directly proportional to acceleration. So if someone says proportional, imagine this is your force and this is your acceleration. 
that's what they mean. It doesn't have to go through the origin. So if this is the zero, zero mark, it doesn't have to go through the origin. If, if they say directly proportional, it does. So directly proportional means that as you double acceleration, you double force, and it goes through the origin. And that's really what we should say. I should actually add this word directly to make it very explicit that it's a direct proportional relationship. There isn't a y-intercept. Okay, 1.5. Um, this is about mass and acceleration, and, and I mean, I'm, everyone kind of did this well, so I'm not going to go, I'm not going to talk too much about what this graph should look like. Any one of you can take these numbers and put them onto a graph. Um, the general pattern should be a curve like that. Some of you made a mistake because you didn't do it, you did a straight line. So it should end up being a curve. Um, the relationship between mass and acceleration is um, as as mass goes up, acceleration ends up going down. So as mass increases, acceleration decreases, gives you the mark. Um, in not, it's not a directly proportional relationship, which is a straight line. This has a special name. Um, if, if you have this pattern, where the special mathematical relationship is if you take any value for your acceleration and your mass and you multiply them by each other, they give you the same answer. So if, if this was 3 and this is 1, then you multiply them and you get 3. If this was um, 1, this would be 3. So that's, that's a special type of relationship. And the name for it is inversely proportional. That's the name for this type of relationship, where it's a curve like that. There are different curves, and so not all curves are inversely proportional, but this one is. And the one, um, if you look at the relationship, force equals mass times acceleration. The force here doesn't change. It says a constant resultant force. So if the force doesn't change, we could put in a number to say what that force was. Like, they could have used 2 newtons, 3 newtons, 4 newtons. Let's just put in... Um, 3.14159 or something like that. So that we've got a nice number in there. Equals mass times acceleration. If we rearrange this to find acceleration, the acceleration is going to equal 3.14159 or whatever the force is divided by mass. And this relationship where one of them is on one side and it's one of them is being divided by on the other side, that's what's called inversely proportional. We sometimes write this as A is proportional to 1 divided by m. So that's how that works. That's what inversely proportional means. The equation that links mass, momentum, and velocity, momentum um, equals mass times velocity. Um, momentum is the symbol p, um, mass times velocity. I don't know where momentum's got a symbol p, but it can't have m because that's really mass. A skater, um, oh no, skater a, travels with a velocity of 3.2 meters per second with a momentum of 200. Calculate the mass of skater A. Well, the momentum, um, or P equals mv, so 200 equals m times 3.2, so m equals 200 divided by 3.2, and that gives us a mass of 62.5 kilograms. Also, if you roughly know, um, Oh, sorry. Okay, sorry about that interruption. Um, yeah, mass here is 62.5 kilograms. You should know that roughly, like, um, you know, someone who's slightly overweight, it might be about 80 kilograms. Um, 60 kilograms is kind of, you know, most people who are in kind of sixth form or um, like a, a very healthy five foot eight person. So, um, and I guess 50, yeah, anything, any, anything around that is just roughly the weight of a, of a person. Here is 3.3. Skater A bumps into another skater, skater B. Skater B is stationary. They move off together. What happens to the velocity of the skaters? So, skater A is moving, skater B is still not moving. And then what happens is skater A hits skater B and they both move off together, and they stay, they, they stay stuck together. So, 
what happens to the velocity of each of the skaters? Well, um, skater A velocity decreases, skater B velocity increases. But the most important part of this is use the idea of conservation of momentum. So momentum is conserved. So the momentum here has to be the same as the momentum there. So here, um, skater B has no momentum, no P, no momentum. This is lots of P, lots of momentum. And all of that momentum has to be um, converted into the momentum of A and B together. Um, so all of the P is there. So imagine that you've got, um, because you've increased the mass of the objects that are moving, um, it means that the velocity of those objects has gone down. So and imagine that A and B had the same mass, then before what you have is, imagine this has a mass of M and, and B has a mass of M, and before the momentum equals um, the velocity of A, MV, plus the velocity of B, which is M0. So this is B's velocity um, times mass. And this is A's velocity times mass. A's velocity times mass. And so that is just going to be M times V. And after the P is going to be both of them together, so it's going to be 2 times M times the new velocity. So conservation of momentum means that the momentum before is equal to the momentum after. So that means that M times V is equal to 2M times the new velocity. So this is the original velocity of A. If we divide both sides by 2m, then we get mv divided by 2m equals the new velocity, and the m's cancel out, so v divided by 2 is the new velocity. Um, you don't have to go through all of those steps to explain this answer, but the basic idea is if they both have the same mass and then they collide together, the new velocity is going to be half the original velocity. So the mark scheme, just to show you is here. You can pause it and have a quick look, but it basically goes through the steps that I've said. Um, three marks available there. Okay. So question four, I think. The newton meter contains a spring. Which newton meter has a spring with a greater spring constant? Um, well, the idea of spring constant is F equals KE, and that's your spring constant. This is your extension, and this is your force. This is your spring constant. So, um, I'm gonna, I, instead of just telling you the answer, I'm going to explain the reason, because some of you got this wrong. If you extend all of these to the maximum value that it will extend by, they all extend to the same length. This one will go down to here, and imagine that's 10 centimeters. This one's 10 centimeters, this one's 10 centimeters, this one's 10 centimeters. They're all extending by the same length. So all the E's are the same. Um, but we know that for this one, it takes 20 newtons to get to the same E. This one takes 10 newtons to get to the same E. This one takes five newtons to get to the same E. This one takes 2.5 newtons to get to the same, same value for E. So the spring constant is gonna be F divided by um, the extension, if you rearrange that equation. So they all have the same extension. Um, this one, for A, the spring constant is going to be 2.5. So for, so for A, it's going to be 2.5 divided by the extension that is the same for all of these. For B, the spring constant is going to be 5 divided by E. For C, it's going to be 10 divided by E. For D, it's going to be 20 divided by E, and it doesn't matter what E is. You don't need to know what E is. You just need to know that if E is the same number, then 20 divided by E is going to be the biggest one. Um, 2.5 divided by E is going to be the smallest one. It doesn't matter what E is, as long as it's not um, a number that's like a, a negative or um, 
Yeah, as, or, or anything like that. Uh, if it's a standard kind of easy to represent number, then um, and a positive number, which it would be, 20 divided by e is going to be your biggest prime set d. Um, and the reason, well, we kind of just said it. It needs the greatest amount of force. It's greater force needed. It's, it's this equation really. It's greater force needed for the same extension. This is a zero. Hi all, sorry for the second interruption, the video just stopped recording. Um, I went through 4.2 um, to nobody because the camera just stopped. But 4.2, um, what happens here is there's a zero error. Um, it's a type of systematic, a systematic error called a zero error where um, the scale is not reading zero at the start. And you see this when you, when you have weighing scales more, more often than um, other things where the weighing scale says something even though there's nothing on it. And the way to do it is to adjust the Newton meter, uh, to fix it is to adjust the Newton meter, but there's usually a screw that you kind of turn at the bottom. Um, or if you, if you catch the zero error afterwards, so say that you've already started to collect data, you can just subtract the zero error from every one of your readings. So if this says one Newton at the beginning when it's meant to say zero, you read 20, it's actually really meant to be 19. You read 18, it's really meant to be um, 17, and so on, and so on, and so on. So you kind of just subtract one Newton every single time. That's not the best way of doing it, because it's obviously more labor-intensive. It's better to adjust the Newton meter at the beginning. Okay, 4.3, a student hangs a weight on the Newton meter. The energy now stored is 4.5. Look what I do. I, I make it very, very clear. Every time I see a number, I'm going to underline it. And I'm going to kind of say what it is. This is energy, and it's 4.5 times 10 to the minus 2 joules. We need to be happy and comfortable with using um, this kind of form, 10 to the minus 2. So the force, um, the weight on the newton meter, which is the force, is 2 newtons. Calculate the extension E of the spring. The spring constant is K. 400 newtons per meter. You need to know these symbols. You need to know that force is F, energy is E. And you need to know the weird ones, like spring constant is K. Um, that's a, a little bit of a strange one. And some of the electricity ones are strange, like Q is charge. You need to know those. They're really important. Um, so we need to work out the energy. And the um, there are two equations that involve Hooke's law. The one, one is F equals K, that we've already kind of said. And the other one is the energy stored by a spring is half Ke squared. So it's just the E that's squared, it's not the K that's squared. Um, if I wanted it to be the K and the E that was squared, I'd put them in brackets, which I'm not going to do. So if you want to work out the total extension of the spring, um, but you know the force, um, you, know, you know the force, you know K, um, and you know something about the energy. This is quite a complicated, a complicated question. So let's break it down. It looks like we could just use F equals K. So if you, um, but there's two steps to this, to this, um, to this question. The student hangs a weight on the newton meter. The energy stored is that, which means it must have extended already. And then the student then adds a new weight, which means it extends by this. So it's almost like there's, um, there's two steps to it. There's a weight that's put on, and then they put another weight on. So we're going to need to find um, a kind of the, the extension for part, for part one. Let's call the energy part part one. And this one, part two. So the extension, part one, and extension, part two. So in the extension, part one, this is about energy. We know what K is. So E equals a half K E squared. Now, we know that the energy stored on the spring is 4.5 um, times 10 to the minus two. We know the spring constant is 400. You can substitute in or you can rearrange. So I'm going to rearrange and multiply both sides. We want to get extension, so we've got to get extension by itself. So we first of all try and get rid of anything that's next to extension. The half is there, let's get rid of that. 
So we can multiply both sides by 2 to get rid of the half. And now we're starting to put things over to the left hand side, which is good. We wanna, we've got the k there, so we're going to try and get rid of the k. So I do 2e divided by k will equal e squared, because if I divide both sides by k, then I get rid of the k on the e squared side. And if you've got a number that's squared, the way that you get rid of the square is you root the whole lot. So now 2e divided by k all rooted is going to equal e. And now I have an equation that I can use. Now I would substitute in, I'd make it really clear to the examiner that I know what I'm doing by actually substituting in now. I'd write 2 times 4.5 times 10 to the minus 2, that's my energy, divided by my k, which is 400. Um, newtons per meter, that's fine. Rooted. And then I just put that in my calculator. The root of um, 2 times 4.5, oops, the root of 2 times 4.5 to minus 2. You have a button at the bottom of your Casio calculator that does the times 10 to the power of. Um, so you haven't got to type in, you don't have to do 4.5 and then times 10 to the power of minus 2. Don't do that. There's a button you've got at the bottom of your calculator. This is a bit like my exp function. You go 4.5 exp minus 2, and it, and it automatically does a times 10 to the power of. So mine has an e. Yours, if the Casio calculators, will have a little button that says times 10 to the power of, and it saves you lots and lots of tapping. So if I do 4.5, that's 3, 4, 5, 6 six buttons to get to 4.5 times 10 to the minus 2. If I did 4.5 um, times 10, I'm already on six buttons, eight, um, 7, 8, 9 equals. So it's more buttons to press on the calculator, more things that can go wrong if you do it the long way around. Do it with the button that you'll find at the bottom, and I find it here. So small, dot, small deviation, let's stop with that. 4.5 times 10 to the minus 2, divided by 400, equals an extension of 0 .0 0 0.015. You'd expect small extensions, because these are meters. So this is 0 0.015 meters, which is 1.5 centimeters. The extension part 2, this is the easier bit, f equals ke. So again, I want to rearrange to get e by itself. So f over k equals e. Um, and so I substitute in my force that I added was 2 newtons, my spring constant is still the same, still 400, and that equals E. Um, and let's work it out, 2 divided by 400 equals 5 times 10 to the minus 3, um, which is actually just 0 0.005. Um, if I add that to my 0 0.015, get my final answer. So if I add this extension to this one, and even if it's in standard form, a lot of you might be a bit kind of wary about using that because you don't see it that often, but you're going to be given marks even if you put it in standard form. So the answer is you take this one and this one and you add them together and you get 0 0.02 meters. But if you had on your calculator 2 times 10 to the minus 2, that's fine. There's not going to be a problem with that. Mark scheme... Yeah, Mark's King has that at the very end. Um, and here you've got one extension and another extension added together. Um, to get to this answer gives you one, two, three marks, because that's the harder bit. Um, to get to this answer, which is extension two, that gives you two marks. Um, and the last mark is to add them together. So that's how you do that question. And the last question on the paper, um, which is question six, um, says 6.1. Uh, 6 Figure eight shows the distance time graph for the car traveling at 15 meters per second. Reaction time increases when the driver is tired and to determine the extra distance the car would travel before um, it starts braking. So, the time in distance, and this is a distance time graph for a car traveling. So, if the car was traveling, if the driver was um, 
tra uh, travels for 0 0.5 meters before breaking, then, sorry, uh, goes for 0 0.5 seconds before breaking, then the distance moved is 7.5 meters in 0 0.5 seconds. If that gets increased to 8.2, seconds, then my ruler is going to fail me here, isn't it? It's a bit too small. There. I've kind of dipped it down. It should be higher. So 12 point something. It's not 12.5. I'm going to say 12.2 just to kind of make it clear that it's definitely not on that line. So I'll say 12.2 meters in... Um, 0.82 seconds. So subtract one from the other. Sorry, 12.2 divided by 7, uh, take away 7.5. I'd say 4.7 meters. So that's how you'd answer that question. And um, there's another way to answer the question as well that I saw people do, which I thought was quite clever. And that was just to say, well, because it's a straight line, well, why don't we work out how far it travels, how far. Um, you travel in 0 0.32 seconds. 0 0.32 seconds is there. And just round it up there. So that's um, for, that's 4.5. So about in the middle. So I'd say, you know, 4.75 meters roughly, which is the same as what we've got here. So that's, that's about right. When you do, um, when you read from any graphs, you're expected to, um, if you get something that's in the middle, you're expected to actually kind of work out what that middle point would be, especially if you've got a graph with grids like this. So you should be able to read on this bottom scale, 0 0.7, obviously that's 0 0.72, but you'd be able to say that that point there was 0 0.71. So you do need to be able to kind of read into the half divisions. 6.2, when the brakes are used, the temperature increases. Explain why. Um, so there is a kinetic energy store in car, and this goes down, this decreases. Um, it's passed onto a thermal energy store, a thermal energy store of the tyres. Of the brakes, sorry. So the kinetic energy of store goes down, passed onto thermal energy store of brakes, which increases. Um, just to check the mark scheme, make sure that we're covering all the points. Decreasing kinetic energy of the car, so the internal thermal energy of the store, uh, thermal energy store of the brakes increases. Yeah, that's fine. Question 6.3. A lorry travels. 8 point, uh, 84 meters of a constant acceleration. Hold on a sec. Okay. Um, 8.4 meters of a constant acceleration. So this is a distance, um, and this is acceleration to reach a velocity of 19. Calculate the initial velocity of the lorry. And the reason I haven't put down d here for distance is because we use that equation. Uh, which is on the physics equation sheet, one you don't have to remember, v squared equals u squared plus 2as. So this is distance, and we sometimes say distance is d, but we also have this idea of displacement, how, how far something has gone from a particular point. So if you start up at point A, and you end up at point B, and you take this path, then you might have travelled um, like 10, 10 miles, but your displacement will be less. Your displacement is the um, is like as the bird flies straight from here to here. So your displacement is less, but your displacement is also a vector; it has a direction too. Um, so your displacement is s. That's what that is. So what is the initial velocity of the lorry? That's your u. So we can substitute in, or we can rearrange. Um, so I'm going to rearrange. You've got v squared minus two as equals u squared because we want to get u by itself, and therefore. And the root of v squared minus 2as is equal to u. So now we can substitute in. The 
final velocity is 19, so I'm going to do 19 squared minus 2 times 2, which is your A, times 84 equals, let's work it out. So the root of 19 squared um, minus 2 times 2 times 84 equals 5. Initial velocity of 5 meters per second. That's it. Done. 6.4. This is about thinking distance, breaking distance, and stopping distance. So we need to remember a few things here. Thinking distance is how far the car will move before you hit the brakes. Breaking distance is how far the car moves um, whilst it's braking. And the stopping distance is the combination of these two added up. So the stopping distance is this one plus this one. Um, and some of you answered this really well. I'm just going to show you the mark scheme for this. This is the last question, really. But the mark scheme kind of covers everything you can, you can expect about this question. Don't worry too much about this. Just try and get these points here. Um, this basically says that you need to be explaining your answer um, fully in detail, um, using kind of really good English and just explaining it in, in a logical fashion. So you go through this one and then this one and then this one. So thinking distance is all here. Things that affect how quickly you think, like tiredness, alcohol, um, if, you're, if, you're, um, if you're under the influence of any drugs or you're distracted, um, if you wrote down things like using your mobile phone, then that's fine because that's a distraction. Those things are going to increase your thinking distance. And thinking distance goes up with this, as a straight line um, with speed. Um, this is all about breaking distance, and this is specific to stopping distance. Um, have a read of that, and that will basically answer the last question. All right, thanks. If you have any questions about this test that you don't think I've answered, then please come and find me. You can have a drop-in on Thursdays after school, or you can just ask me in class. Thanks very much.